So as um, stated, I will give information about manifesting religion and belief in public. Uh, there are two topics that I want to discuss. So the full Vaceville and also a specific French problem, which was the Burkini at the beaches. You have probably heard about it in the media. Uh, so it's pretty interesting to know the specific context about these um, bans. Uh, and then you will see my presentation that there are other topics on the lat latest um, uh, presentation uh, about, uh, I think it was um, ritual slaughter, about identification documents and also about uh, religious symbols in court. If I have time, and I think I will, uh, I will also give information about the decisions that were brought by the European uh, Court of Human Rights and also about the Court of Justice. Just some promotion of my equality body, but that's not important. Obviously, it's important to start with the legal framework. Now, this morning, a lot has been said, so I will not repeat everything, but I just want to emphasize um, certain aspects. So I will focus on Article 9 of the European Convention on uh, Human Rights. But as you know, and as st stated this morning, it's not uh, only protected by this convention, but it's also protected by different a range of national, international and European texts. For example, uh, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, but also the European Charter on Fundamental Rights, Article 10. But we saw this this morning, so I will not repeat it. Um, I just wanted to emphasize that the freedom of thought, conscience and religion it's a very important fundamental right because um, in the cases that me as a legal advisor of uh, uh, UNIA, the equality body, receive, uh, people tend to uh, find this human right not that very important to um, actually to, to limit actually the, the, the importance of this uh, fundamental right. So that's why I wanted to emphasize that it's a fundamental right. And I think it was stated this morning by uh, Professor Kuipers. Uh, it's also one of the foundation of a democratic society. And this importance has actually been uh, c c confirmed by different European judges and different uh, judgments of the European Court of Human Rights, stating that it's uh, one of the foundations of a democratic society and actually it's one of the vital factors for uh, believers to develop their identity in a democratic society. So it's important to start with that and to emphasize the importance of uh, the freedom of uh, thought, conscience and religion. Now, obviously, it's important to know what religions are protected and what kind of protections these article, uh, this Article 9, uh, Part 1 uh, provides. And I will briefly um, give information about that because we had an enormous discussion this morning. A lot of information was given by the speakers of this morning about the way that Article 9, Paragraph 1 uh, should be uh, interpreted and should be applied in practice. So as stated before, um, it stands actually, it has two, it has a dual protection, first of all to the right to hold a belief or not to believe, but also to change a belief. And uh, with all the discussions aside, this is absolute and unconditional, so it can be limited by a state party. And then a second uh, part is also the, the right to manifest this religion and belief in private, in public, in group or alone. So this is very important, also stated in Article 9, Part 1. Um, and also this, this article shows what way actually religion can be manifested in worship, in teaching, in practice and in observance. So a very a broad um, interpretation and a very broad protection provided by Article 9. So obviously it's also important to know what kind of religions are protected by this uh, Article 9, by this uh, freedom of religion. This was stated before, but uh, I wanted to repeat it again. So religion as such is not defined by the text of Article 9 and also not by the case law of, the, art of uh, the European Court of Human Rights. And that's quite logical because a definition has to be flexible enough to be uh, applied in a whole range of religious and, 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 and non-religious opinions. So minor, uh, major uh, uh, religion, theistic, non-theistic, uh, and et cetera, and et cetera. So a very uh, broad range has to be protected. But this definition has, has to be at the same time specific enough to be applied in individual cases. So that's why the court never um, gives a definition of what is religion as, as such. But it's uh, clear on the basis of the case law of the European Court of Human Rights that religious and non-religious opinions and convictions are protected. Just to give an example of what was actually acknowledged as being protected by Article 9 by the European Court of Human Rights, as stated this morning, pacifism, but also uh, being uh, opposis uh, opposition to military service, veganism, of course, very important nowadays, and uh, the opposition to manipulation of products uh, of animals, uh, origin or tested on animals. Also, opposition to abortion was also found as protected as a non-religious opinion, and also the doctor's opinion on alternative medicine, 
which constitutes a manifestation of medical philosophy. So very broad and very uh, wide range of non-religious beliefs that are protected by Article uh, 9. Now, what's very important is, as I state, um, the state party or a court cannot give, give a definition of religion, but uh, in order to, to uh, have this protection, this manifestation of a religion and belief must attain a certain level of coherency, seriousness, cohesion, and importance. This was also mentioned before this morning, but I wanted to mention it again. We had, uh, I think it was Professor Kapers who referred to the Pastafarians, you know, believing in the flying spaghetti monster. The, 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 the discussion is whether or not this is a religion, yes or no. Uh, well, there is a judgment of the U.S. There was a federal judge who concluded this is not a religion because it's purely mockery. And a recent dis uh, decision of uh, the Council of States of the Netherlands also concluded uh, the same way that it's, it's actually criticizing a decision, uh, criticizing religion as such. So this is not actually uh, cohesion, seriousness, cohesion and importance. So you cannot apply the protection of Article 9. It was actually in a discussion because they believe that um, they have to wear a pasta strainer the whole time, so if they want to change their identification documents, they wanted to give a pass photo with, yeah, it's pretty funny, that, that's, um, that's the way it works in, in uh, the law system, so they wanted to give a photo with this strainer, strainer to enable in, in to change their identification um, documents, and obviously in the Netherlands it was not accepted. We have some discussions in Belgium, but we are gladly to refer to uh, the jurisprudence of the Netherlands to say, well, this is actually the limit. This is actually purely a joke. So uh, this is no protection of uh, the Article 9 of, of, uh, of the European Convention on Human Rights. Now, if a petitioner states that, well, a certain practice is actually motivated by my religion and belief, and it attains this level of cohesion, seriousness, cohesion, and importance, then that would be sufficient to apply Article 9. So as stated this morning, but I wanted to mention it again, so we'll never forget it after these two days, um, that um, it's not up to the state party or the court to assess in, in the legitimacy of certain religion beliefs or manifestations of these religions and beliefs. So it's not about having a theological debate. If someone states, well, this is my manifestation of religion and belief, it's not to the court to check, well, is it true? What does the, 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 the Bible or the Quran, or et cetera, says? No, it's, uh, it has to be... They have to be impartial and they have to be neutral, so they can't give any uh, interpretations of that question. So that's very important to mention it. Um, now, obviously, as I stated before and stated this morning, um, the manifestation of religion belief is not absolute and can be uh, limited if three conditions are respected. And these conditions are provided by Article 9, Paragraph 2, as stated this morning, but I will give maybe more information about the way that these conditions can uh, be um, interpreted. And first of all, it has to be prescribed by law. So there has to be a domestic uh, legal basis for limitation. And it's important to, to know that uh, the European Court of Human Rights uses an autonomous notion of law. So it's autonomous in two levels. First of all, um, it's actually satisfied with a substantial uh, notion of law, so it doesn't have to be a formal law, meaning adopted by a parliament and etc. A law, it can be written, it can be unwritten, so it has to be a legal basis, but not a, a formal law as such. And then it checks whether this law, written or unwritten, um, actually respects certain qualitative standards, so it has to be um, accessible and it has to be foreseeable. So the, the general limitation has to be known, and obviously the civilians has to know what the, this limitation means, it has to be uh, transparent enough for these uh, civilians. Second of all, it has to be uh, in interest of a legitimate aim, and it's also provided in Article 9, Paragraph 2. What are these legitimate aims? First of all, it's a protection of uh, public safety, the protection of the public order, also health or morals, or the protection of the rights and freedoms of others. Um, in this discussion about freedom of religion and belief, it's often public safety that is invoked, public order, but also the protection of the rights and freedoms of others, which was the case in the full phase fail, which I will give more information about. And then last but not least, very important, a limitation has to be necessary in a democratic society. I mentioned uh, proportionality, but the courts actually uses different concepts to see whether or not the latest um, condition is actually fulfilled. First of all, it checks whether there is a pressing social need or uh, checks whether the, you know, the principle of proportionality, obviously, is there a fair, fair balance between the conflicting rights in a specific individual case? Are there relevant and sufficient reasons? 
and uh, or obviously it takes into account the margin of, of appreciation of the state parties. So in some cases where there isn't any European consensus about a certain uh, aspect of the freedom of religion, such as the full faith veil, then uh, the court tends to give more margin of appreciation to the state parties to decide whether or not to limit uh, this uh, freedom of religion. So that was in a nutshell the protection of Article 9. There is so much to say, but I will limit it to these aspects. And then we will go to the two uh, topics that are relevant for my presentation, which is the case of the full face veil and Burkiniata Beach. You can see that I uh, gave a print screen of a publication. It's actually a publication of um, the working group of Equinet. <coughs> I don't know if you know Equinet, but it's actually a network of the um, equality bodies of the European Union. And they have different working groups. And one working group works on a uh, legal issue. It's called the Working Group Equality Law. And in 2011, this working group wrote a publication about uh, religious discrimination in Europe, about uh, you know, different cases that the equality bodies are confronted with, with this issue. And um, in 2017, this um, publication was actually uh, updated. So it's interesting to look at. I have a version here, but you can find it on the website. And there is a chapter about manifestation of religion and belief in public. And the two uh, issues that are here mentioned are also uh, briefly and also um, analyzed uh, um, in, in, in light of the, the jurisprudence of the European Court of Human Rights. So what are we talking about? Now, as you know, probably, but there are different uh, bans in European countries of full face uh, veils. It's often uh, nationwide bans that are adopted by the state parties, but, um, nationwide or partial bans. Uh, or if there is not a nationwide ban, then it's the regions of that specific country that adopt bylaws to prohibit it for their specific region. Um, I think France was one of the first countries to uh, ban uh, full face fields in public spaces. Belgium obviously followed, as they always do, but uh, there's also Bulgaria, Denmark and Austria. Um, and uh, partial bans. I don't have any examples, but I know in the Netherlands that there is a proposition for a partial ban. If, if someone is here from the Netherlands, you can confirm. Yes, it's true. Okay, good. And then uh, Italy and Spain don't have a nationwide ban, but they have bylaws. In specific regions, uh, in these regions, there is a ban on full uh, face fails. Now, these bans have in common that they are written in a normal, in a normal, in a general uh, neutral way, but in practice, obviously, Muslim women who wear the niqab or the burqa are targeted. I don't know if you know the difference between a niqab or a burqa. It's not really that important, but the niqab shows the eyes and the other one has a sort of transparent tissue in front of it so that the women obviously can see where they're going, but their eyes are not visible for the external people. And it's often um, integrated in a criminal law with obviously sanctions linked to it if you don't respect the ban, uh, such as fines, compulsory course in citizenship, imprisonment, and uh, recently Bulgaria also adopted a law and they provide uh, cuts in benefits. So that if these women does not, do not respect the bans, they will have maybe a benefit cut if it's decided by uh, the courts. Um, also, the reasons to justify these bans are often the same for these countries. Um, First of all, it's equality between men and women and human dignity. So the equality between men and women means that, you know, this, this practice is actually imposed by men and it's a symbol of suppression uh, of women. So it can be um, prohibited in the name of equality between men and women and human dignity. The argumentation is, well, a body without a face is a body without human dignity because you are you know, they're not revealing their faces, so they don't have any human dignity. And that's why in order to protect the human dignity of this woman, we have to ban uh, this practice of clothing. And then the second argument is public security. Because, yeah, if obviously in public places, if you're not able to identify people, that would be problematic for the public order and the public safety because police, for example, must be able to identify everyone who is in the public spaces in order to prevent criminal activities, suicide bombings, and et cetera, and et cetera. So the ban is necessary to maintain public safety and uh, public order. And last but not least, and that's a pretty interesting argument, is social interaction. So, so state parties argue, well, we as a state, we find communication between individuals very important, and that's why we find that um, a full face veil 
uh, limits the possibility of communication between individuals and that's why we have to ban because we want to create a, a, a social democracy and in order for the social link to exist people must be um, able to identify one another in order to communicate one another. So these are the three main arguments that are uh, used and uh, the European Court of Human Rights analyzes these three arguments to see whether or not it's sufficient enough, whether, whether it's a legitimate aim and it's necessary in a democratic society to use these arguments to justify the ban on the full face hail. Uh, the cases SAS versus France, Dakir versus Belgium, Belkasmi and Osar versus Belgium. The cases against Belgium are from 2017, SAS versus France are from 2014, so that's why you know, the argumentation is very comparable and it was no surprise that in the, in the cases of Belgium Obviously, the courts um, followed the, the argumentation of the SAS versus France case. Now, what did the court ex, uh, uh, accept it as, a, um, as an argument and, and as necessary in a democratic society? <coughs> Sorry. First of all, it did not uh, accept the dignity of women and equality between men and women. Regarding equality between women and women, the European Court said, well, you cannot invoke as a state party's argument if the practice is defended by these women. So if they choose to wear it, then you cannot uh, argue that it's against equality between men and women because they choose to wear it and you as a state party cannot invoke that argument. And the same uh, argumentation was used to um, put aside the argument of uh, dignity of women. The court acknowledged, well, it can be seen as weird because we're not used to women uh, covering their faces up, but that's uh, uh, expression of a cultural identity, which is actually very important in a democratic society. You have different of opinions, you have different of, of uh, cultural identities. So that's why we have to accept it as a, a practice, a cultural practice of a certain woman. Um, <coughs> regarding public security, the court said, well, obviously that's a legitimate aim because a state party might, might find it uh, important for in public places to uh, be able to identify everyone in order to prevent criminal activities, in order to prevent um, identification fraud. But it was not necessary in a democratic society because it was a broad blanket ban um, applicable in the whole public place and the state parties did not show that there is a reason, that there is an effective um, security problem or uh, uh, a risk of the public order, of the public safety. So it was not necessarily, and because there are alternatives, because you can uh, oblige these women, for example, to remove their full face veil in certain conditions, for example, when they go to the airport, when they go get their children, or uh, when they, change, they want to change their identification documents, and et cetera, and et cetera. So because of the fact that the ban is so broad, it's not necessary because it's disproportionate. And then last but not least, uh, social interaction. And social interaction was actually accepted by the court as a legitimate aim, stating that, well, you know, state parties can give particular weight to uh, the ability to communicate with one another. So individuals, uh, state parties can um, uh, find it important that individuals communicate uh, with one another and it's accepted as a part of the protection of the rights and freedoms of others. So. First of all, the court said, well, this is a legitimate aim. And is it necessary in a democratic society? The court said, uh, yes. At the same time, it acknowledged it is a broad ban, because it's a blanket ban for public places. Um, and it carried also the possibilities of sanctions. In, for Belgium, it's imprisonment. For France, there are other uh, sanctions that are possible. And it could primarily affect Muslim women, because uh, it's, it could lead to their isolation and also the restriction of, of the autonomy of this woman. But it is necessary in a democratic society because, first of all, the prohibition is actually written in a neutral way, so religious clothing as such is not targeted. Two, um, the penalty of, of, um, of not respecting the ban is relatively minor uh, because I think in Belgium it's, you can go to jail for eight days, so the courts perceive it as relatively minor. And, um, well, it only restricts specific uh, types of clothing. So not every religious clothing is actually banned, but only specific kinds of clothing, which is a full face veil. So that's why the court found it uh, proportionate to prohibit it to benefit and to respect actually the, the living together between individuals in a, in a, in a, 
in a public and a democratic society. It also added, and that's what I said and mentioned about the margin of appreciation, there is a lack of European consensus about these questions in Europe, and that's why the court gave more and a great margin of appreciation to the states and stated, well, it's a choice of society whether or not to prohibit this um, as for Vaysville, and it was actually a result of a democratic uh, process because it was accepted by law and etc. and etc. And um, France and also Belgium have the scope to give an interpretation to the European Convention of Human Rights. And um, it's an issue of society, uh, so that's why it is proportionate, taking into account these different kind of organizations. Um, I think this morning Professor Kuyper said, well, the Human Rights Committee came to another conclusion. I will give more information about it um, later on. Just to gr brief, give more information about this argument of living together. So, in a nutshell, um, it accepted social interaction, living together as an argument to prohibit full, uh, to prohibit full face veils, and it was uh, founded as necessary in a democratic society by the European Court of Human Rights. So that's the first topic. Um, and then the second topic, it's Burkini at the beach. So um, we had this particular issues in France. Um, maybe to give more information about the context. So it was the year that the terrorist attack happened in Nice. A lot of people died and etc. So a very awful situation that happened. And afterwards, different uh, seaside municipalities adopted uh, bylaws to prohibit uh, attire which was not proper and respectful of good morals, secularism, health, and security. So again, uh, formulated in a very neutral, general way, but in practice, women wearing the burkini were targeted. And I don't know if you know the burkini, but it's a body covering swimsuit, um, mostly worn by Muslim women in order that they can go swimming, actually, in respect with their religious uh, beliefs. Um, so these bylaws were attacked, some bylaws were attacked, uh, by uh, NGOs, it was actually the Human Rights League, if I'm not mistaken, and they went to do the Administrative Court of Appeal and also the Council of State to check whether or not it's there are sufficient reasons to ban uh, such uh, attire to uh, Muslim women. Um, there are two decisions, actually different decisions, but I will just uh, mention three decisions. First, there is the, the bylaw of the city Villeneuve-Loubet, which is a city near Nice that was attacked in front of the administrative courts uh, of appeal, and later on it went to the Council of State. And there was also a bylaw of the municipality of Cisco, which is uh, in, the, in the neighborhood of uh, Haute-Corse, and that was also attacked in front of the administrative court of appeal. Now, uh, regarding the bylaw of uh, Villeneuve-Loubet, the administrative court of appeal stated, well, there are sufficient reasons to apply uh, these bans because there is effectively a problem of national security and uh, a, a risk for the health and the security in relation to ba bathing attire. But this was obviously not respected and not accepted by the Council of State. So the Council of State uh, found the decision of the administrative court as uh, void and null and uh, ordered the suspension of that decision because obviously it's not possible to show this risk that exists in relation to uh, the bathing attire. The, the municipality did not show that wearing a burkini is actually uh, a risk to the security of these municipalities. The other decision that I mentioned was the decision of the uh, Marseille Administrative Court of Appeal, and there it was accepted because but that's a specific context because there were issues between members of uh, the, the community of the municipalities and, uh, and members who, were, who didn't live there. There were actually violent uh, fights that broke out, vehicles got burned, les gendarmes, and also the police had to intervene. So that's why the court said, well, in that specific context, it is um, actually accepted and there is actually a, a, a risk uh, of breaches against the peace and good order. So. These were the two cases that I wanted to mention, and just maybe a, um, a, a brief resume. In the two cases, and obviously we cannot compare a burkini with uh, a, a burqa because the one covers the face and the other does not, but it's actually examples of the will of the legislator to limit the freedom, the manifestation of the freedom of religion and belief in public places. In the same, in the two ways, in the two, uh, regarding the two clothings, types. Uh, the bans were formulated, formulated in a general way, but always specific groups were targeted, in this case uh, Muslim. Muslim women were targeted indirectly. And obviously regarding the Burkini issue in France, we had a specific context of um, 
the, the, the terrorist attacks, but obviously it's the wrong message that you're sending because Muslim women felt that they were collectively, co collectively punished um, due to um, the fact that these terrorist attacks uh, happened uh, in the city of, of Nice. And maybe that's a remark on the decisions of the European Court of Human Rights, this notion of living together, and on the basis of that, uh, prohibiting actually the full face veil, we can question that, because it's the first time that the European Court of Human Rights invoked that argument as, a, as, a, as an aspect of the protection of freedom, uh, of the rights and the freedoms of others. It never happened, it was the first time. So for legal certainty issues, I think we can question that. So um, yeah, and maybe the state, and that's, and that's why I wanted to mention the decision of the Human Rights Committee. But recently, it was in October 2018, the Human Rights Committee of the UN decided uh, on the bans, the full face veils uh, in uh, of France. Um, and, it's, and it concluded that uh, they were actually disproportionate, way too general because there are broad bans, uh, it's about public places, and they mentioned that for public security reasons there aren't any sufficient reasons to um, this, this risk of breaching this, uh, the, the public security and public order was not shown by the state party, so by France. And specific, the notion of living together, they said, well, that's, that's all, it's not sufficient enough to, um, to actually uh, justify a general ban on wearing the full face veil in public uh, places. So it's pretty interesting to see that the Human Rights Committee has a different line of, of, uh, and a different way of deciding about these issues in comparison with the European Court of Human Rights. Do I still have time? Okay. So that's why I wanted to mention the... Um, other issues outside the workplace, very quickly. Um, first of all, religious symbols in courtrooms, the case Hamidovic versus Bosnia and Herzegovina, El Ashiri versus Belgium. So the two cases are comparable. <coughs> it was about, uh, Hamidovic is a man, a Muslim, who wears a skull cap, which is a small uh, hat that um, some Muslim when, men wear because of their religious belief. And he argumented that, and he had to testify in a criminal procedure and the, the, the judge asked him to remove the skull cap because it was against the neutrality of the courtrooms to, in order to, the, uh, the, to protect sorry, the, the, the secularism that uh, the courtroom has to, to show in the practice. So that's why they said, well, you cannot wear religious symbols, in this case, the skull cap. He refused. He had to pay the fine. He didn't pay the fine, so he had to go to jail for 30 days, actually. And then he went to the European Court of Human Rights, and the U European Court of Human Rights concluded, well, this is actually, the, the, the Bosnia-Herzegovina went too far and did not respect actually their margin of appreciation, because first of all, this is an individual. It's not a, pu a public official, official uh, so it's not someone who works actually for the, the, the city of the state as such. So you cannot invoke these neutrality principles on uh, individuals, on civilians. It's not the same thing as, for example, working for a public institution. Um, and very important is also the behavior of Hamidovic. His behavior was correct. He did not make any scene. He did not disturb the, the, the procedure and everything. So on the basis of that, the court concluded that there is a violation of Article 9 of the European Convention of Human Rights. And then in the case Lashidi versus Belgium, it was about a headscarf, but comparable facts. So she had, she was party in a criminal procedure in the murder of her brother, and a judge asked her again to remove her headscarf, which she refused, and she did not, uh, was not allowed to go into court. Uh, again, um, while neutrality was not invoked as such in Belgium, it was actually uh, more to, to, to make sure to prevent behavior that is not respectful towards the judicial system in, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Belgium and also to guarantee a good course of the audience. That was actually the reason that was invoked in Belgium. And the court stated in the same and comparable way as in Hamidovic, that first of all, she's an individual, she's not a public uh, official, so you cannot invoke it in the same way as in a, for a public official. So that's why Belgium, you went too far and you uh, breached also the freedom of religion. Um, what was interesting, also the same thing about the behavior stating that, well, if, if someone's behavior is problematic, then obviously we can refuse that person in a courtroom. But Lashiri respected the court, respected the judges. Her behavior was not problematic, so that's why, uh, as Belgium, you went too far and, it's in, and you limited the freedom of religion in a, in a, in a non-confirmed uh, way of Article 9, Paragraph 2. And then we had the case of the ritual slaughter. It was a particular case is about Belgium. Um, maybe just to explain the context, 
So ritual slaughter, maybe to give you context now, but at the moment when the Court of Justice took that decision, there wasn't a general ban on ritual slaughter in Belgium. Now there is in specific parts of Belgium, in the French-speaking part and in the Flemish-speaking part, but at that time that wasn't the case. So what was actually the problem here? So in Belgium, I think a lot, in a lot of countries, there is a general ban on, on, uh, on uh, slaughter without stunning, but an exception is foreseen for ritual slaughter. And it's mostly Muslim or people of the Jewish uh, religion that want to, to use that kind of practice because their uh, religious prescriptions say that an animal should be slaughtered in, uh, without stunning, actually. So an exception was foreseen in our legislation. Uh, in, but one condition is that this ritual, ritual slaughter must be done in um, slaughterhouses that are recognized by uh, the regions. So what is the problem? Muslims have the feast of sacrifice and for that feast they have to slaughter an animal and the problem is that there aren't sufficient slaughterhouses that are recognized to fulfill the demand of these Muslims. Um, and in the past, before 2014, the minister who was competent for animal welfare did a sort of, uh, sort of a temporary rec uh, recognition of slaughterhouses. So just for that specific period of three, it's three days, they uh, temporarily recognized some slaughterhouses. But with the new minister, which uh, he was accounted for in 2014, that was uh, actually uh, changed and he was not willing to foresee this exception, a specific exception uh, for the Feast of Sacrifice because he said it's against European legislation and it's true that the European legislation said well uh, state parties can, uh, the members of the EU can provide an exception if uh, this exception is done in specific conditions and this condition means that the slaughterhouses must be recognized. Uh, so these uh, van Moskee, so it's actually organizations of Muslims that went to court and uh, they went to tribunal of first instance in Belgium and the tribunal referred the case to the Court of Justice by preliminary ruling. And the question was, is this obligation to provide literal, ritual slaughter in recognized slaughterhouses, is that a breach of the freedom of religion, yes or no? And the Court of Justice concluded in the decision that it's not, obviously it's pretty logic, because it's actually intended to organize and to manage the freedom to practice ritual slaughter, taking into account the fundamental rules on the protection of animal welfare and the health of the consumers of meat. So that wasn't actually a very surprise, that decision. But as I stated before, there is a new context now because there is a general ban and different organization of Jewish organizations, but also Muslim organizations went in Belgium to the constitutional court to attack this general ban, but we still don't have any decision. And then last but not least, that's religious headgear in identity documents. There are two cases, again, of the European Court of Human Rights, which is Man Singh versus France and uh, Ranjit Singh versus France. And there is, again, a decision of the Human Rights Committee, which, again, was uh, not the same as a decision of the European Court of Human Rights. Now, these two men are Sikh and wear, and wear a turban. They wanted to change their identification documents. And in order to make these documents, they gave a photograph with a turban, obviously, because they wear in their daily life turbans, and that was not accepted by the French authorities. The French authorities said, well, in order to guarantee the public safety, in order to make identification uh, easier in practice, we, we ban actually headgear on uh, identification photographs, even for religious headgears. The man went to Man Singh and also Ranjit Singh went to the European Court of Human Rights, and the courts uh, ordered and, and decided that there is no violation of Article 9 of the Convention because, um, actually because not, because they didn't actually make an analyze in what way uh, the public safety is endangered by accepting an exception for religious headgear. So uh, Rajit Singh went then to the Human Rights Committee and the committee concluded that there is a violation of uh, the freedom of religion because um, it's, it's not shown in what way the, the, the public safety is actually endangered because first of all, the face is not covered, the face is, is, is shown, there is no problem, and second of all, identification would be easier because the man wears on a daily basis a turban, which is pretty ridiculous to refuse it, um, uh, yeah, to refuse it if, if someone wears a headscarf or a turban or uh, a kippah in daily life. So it's interesting to see that this Human Rights Committee decided completely differently than the European Court of Human Rights. 